some of the earliest experiments to prove that Einstein's relativity theory were correct are a little bit more difficult to, to understand than some modern day experiments. We're going to look at uh, a different set of experiments that kind of demonstrate some of the similar principles of Einstein's relativity. Historically, it was Michelson and Morley's interference experiment which showed that Einstein's th postulates of relativity were correct. But the more modern experiments will take advantage of some technologi technological capabilities that were not available to Michelson and Morley, and it will be a little bit easier to see why some of Einstein's new postulates were better than the original postulates upon which mechanics was based. We'll return to Michelson and Morley's experiments soon, but for now, the experiments that we're going to talk about will show, first, that Galilean relativity doesn't work. In Galilean relativity, velocities add when we move from one frame of reference to another. And if, a, if a, a, an object has a speed v in one reference frame and the two reference frames move with a speed of v prime, we know that in another reference frame we're supposed to add those two speeds. Galilean relativity doesn't work, and Einstein suggested that all observers will observe a speed c for the speed of light. The second experiment we're going to show, or look at, the second experiment we're going to look at demonstrates that the speed of c is a maximum for speed of propagation for any information in the world. And in fact, nothing can go faster than the speed of c. Let's look at the first experiment. This shows that the speed of c, or the speed of light, is the same in all reference frames. This is an experiment dating back to 1964 and was conducted at the CERN laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. To know about this experiment means that we'll have to learn a little bit about particle physics. In particle physics, there's a particle called a neutral pion. In other words, it's electrically neutral. And it decays to two photons, which are the carriers of light when it decays, it ceases to exist. It gives up all of its energy of, of existence, its mass, into making the two energetic photons. In order to conserve momentum and energy, they have to go in opposite directions. That's at least in the frame of reference of the pi zero. Photons are carriers of light, or the particles that carry the information about light, and so they move at the speed of c. But what happens if this neutral pion is itself moving? We could make a beam, let's say, of neutral pions moving in the lab at some high velocity. When it decays, we can imagine that the two photons come screaming forward. But what will the speed of the two photons be if they're originally going to be at a speed of c, but now the pion is moving? Would it be the case that the speed of the photon is the speed of the pion plus c? And what about if this case is of the pion moving at nearly the speed of c itself? What if we could accelerate it or create one at very, very high velocity? Would it be possible to create a photon then that's moving at speed 2c? That's what the experimenters tried to show. The experimental demonstration was done at CERN, which is a particle physics laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. The experimenters had a high-energy proton accelerator, which they could aim at a target. Protons travel around in a circular orbit in, this, in the accelerator until they were steered out and struck a target located at T. When the proton beam hits the target, a shower of various kinds of particles are created. Some of them are electrically charged, some of them are electrically neutral. And although not all particles were, were the, the neutral pion, some neutral pions were created in that shower of particles. But now one has a beam of quite a few different particles of different speeds and different uh, species. Two magnets were located downstream of the target, and the magnets could be used to steer away particles of electric charge. Those that are electrically neutral would keep traveling in a straight line, like the pi zero. When the pi zero eventually decayed to two photons, these photons would keep traveling in a straight line as well, and eventually would be detected by scintillator counters located at A and A prime, 
and b prime. Notice the scale of this experiment where 10 meters is actually a, a very small part of this experiment. So this experiment was hundreds of meters long. In this experiment, the neutral pions had a momentum on the order of 6 giga electron volts, and so the velocity of each pion was something very close to the speed of light. At each of the stations, the four stations, A, A prime, B, and B prime, the experimenters would record the time of arrival of a photon at one of those stations. The distance between locations A and B was measured very precisely to be 31.45 meters with an error of about one and a half millimeters. That's a percentage error of about one in 10 to the four, or 10 to the minus four, or 0.01%. The distances A and A prime and B B prime were about four and a half meters, which was too short to make a useful measurement, but those increments were helpful to cal calibrate the apparatus. The experimenters measured the time intervals for the photons to arrive either at A, B, A prime, or B prime. And the, pho the photon speed was then inferred from measuring the delta x over delta t. The resolution for making a measurement for a single photon was something on the order of 0.35 nanoseconds. In other words, the simulator counters had the capability of reporting the time of arrival of a photon at one of those counters, but with this kind of error. That's for a single measurement, and then in the course of the experiment, they made measurements of several million pion decays. After, measuring, after averaging many measurements, they found an average time to take for a photon to travel between point A and point B to be about 105 nanoseconds. Now, what would be the uncertainty on this measurement? It's not actually 0.35 nanoseconds. 0.35 nanoseconds is the time uncertainty for a single measurement, but since the experimenters averaged many measurements, we can think of that 0.35 nanoseconds as the spread of results if you histogrammed the, the process that they measured many times over. In other words, this quantity sigma t, which is 0.35 nanoseconds, is like the full width half max of a histogram of measuring this, uh, this quantity or this time difference many times over. But we're interested in the uncertainty on the average. That's that location right there. If you think about it, averaging over many such ex uh, experiments or many such time increments should help improve your uncertainty on the average. When you average n measurements, the uncertainty on the average is a quantity called sigma of delta t bar, which is the individual measurement uncertainty, sigma t, divided by the square root of n. Now it's still helpful to have a good single measurement uncertainty because if the histogram is very wide, then our uncertainty on where the location of the average is is, is considerably poorer than in the case when the distribution is very narrow. In this case, the quantity 0.35 nanoseconds is the full width half max for the many measurements of the photons to arrive at a single counter, either A or A prime or B or B prime. But we're interested in knowing how well they knew the average location of the, or average time for the photons to arrive at a particular location. With 100,000 measurements of each arrival time, the uncertainty on this quantity of delta T AB was about 0.35 nanoseconds divided by 320 because 320 is about the square root of 100,000. Therefore, the uncertainty on this time delta t was about 0.001 nanoseconds, so the time measurement was accurate to about one part in 10 to the fifth. If you recall, the, the distance separation between these two counters was 31.45 meters, with an accuracy of about one part in 10 to the four. This gives a speed, delta x over delta t, which was supposed to be the measurement of the speed of the photon. 
they found 2.9974 times 10 to the 8 meters per second with an error of about one part in 10 to the 4. Thus, the photons were still observed to be moving at speed c, even though they were launched from a neutral pion, which itself was traveling at speed c. It might have been naively thought that the photons would be traveling at speed 2c, but instead they held only speed c. Therefore, all it, the, Einstein's first postulate that all photons or all, will travel at the speed of light, or all observers will agree on what the speed of light is, turns out to be true.